Hi everyone, my name is Taylor Williams and I'm the director of Tide Film Festival. Welcome to Tide's third annual film festival. We are so happy you can join us from the comfort of your home. I am ecstatic to introduce visual storytelling at its best panel presented by HBO. I will now hand it off to Albert Lawrence, an IMDb correspondent and Amazon Live host. Thank you, Taylor. It's a pleasure to be here today, especially because this panel, I believe, is going to be incredibly uplifting and inspiring. So let's welcome our panelists right now. So we have Eric Yamamoto, who's a storyboard artist for Lovecraft Country. I know you guys are giving your virtual applause out there. And we also have Tang Lei, the illustrator from Westworld. Welcome, Tang. So first, starting off, um, Eric, can you tell all of us what exactly does a storyboard artist do and how do you do it? Um, I'd say there's a different types of storyboard artists. You know, there's, there's ones that take a script and they, you know, break it down, shot listing it out and then translating that into visuals. And then there are others that don't have a script at all and they have to just kind of come up with it on the go. Mm. Kind of like a hybrid writer slash uh, illustrator. Wow. Um, I've tried it both ways. You know, both ways are, um, they both have their pros and cons, you know, but uh, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun and a lot of, a lot of mileage, just a lot of drawing, 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 drawing as fast as you can kind of a thing. Wow. But um, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, it, it sounds like there's there's quite the range in there within what you said that a story that a storyboard artist can be expected to do. So looking forward to digging into that some more today. And Tang, as an illustrator specifically on Westworld, what does a day look like for you, and what does a season look like for you? Uh, so what we do is we we're part of the art department, and uh, we help visualize uh, various sets. Uh, vehicles, robots, and certain moments in, in, in the show. Mm. Uh, a typical day is uh, we'll read a script, we'll get assigned uh, a set or a robot or whatnot, and we'll create various ideas, uh, whether it's 2D or in a 3D program, and then we'll present that to the production designer and the showrunners. Got it. So is there any given point maybe that a storyboard artist and an illustrator might end up connecting and or collaborating on a show? All the time. Um, a lot of times we'll be creating uh, what you call a keyframe. It's a moment in the film or the show. And those keyframes are often uh, pulled from the storyboard, storyboards that someone like Eric would have done. And then we'll take that and we'll plus it out, meaning will uh, paint it up to make it almost match a, a, a frame from the show. Oh, sweet. Okay. Cool. So it's like, kind of like mine's kind of the skeleton and then you give it to an illustrator and then they'll flesh it out to make it presentable to someone who doesn't know the show. Ah. It's like kind of pitch it possibly, but there's other reasons. I mean, there's other reasons for illustrations, other reasons for storyboards. Yeah. And sometimes it works in reverse too. We'll design yeah. And we'll send the set over to the scoreboard artist and they'll create the gag or the moment within that set that we designed. I think that that's one of the thrilling thing about working in the arts is that there's not just one specific route, one specific way. Things happen, ideas percolate and formulate all over the place. So I want to learn from the both of you, like what exactly attracted you to the visual arts? Eric, you can start off first and then Tang, uh, way on in. Why the visual arts and, and why film and television specifically? Yeah, my, um, my mom was a traditional animator and my dad did visual effects. Mm. And um, so I've kind of always been in Hollywood, you know? And um, let's see, when I was in high school, I did a lot of drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and like the only way to like kind of get away from that was to do art. Mm. And I decided to like, I needed to get away from the drugs. Parents mm. helped me out. I applied to Chicago art Institute. Once I got there, it was clean. And, wow. um, but then, yeah, I, I developed a lot of my thinking, uh, mm. in inter interdisciplinary 
um, education, just seeing, you know, like sculpture, doing uh, film, doing drawing, doing painting. And mm. I mean, a storyboard is just basically you're, you're, you're the cinematographer for the moment and you're the, uh, the gaffer for the moment. You're the, mm. the actor for the moment. You're the set designer for the moment. And like, you, you, you get to play with all the different um, disciplines. And that, that's what attracted me to it. And, and plus it's just, uh, you get to draw a lot of pictures, a lot of pictures. And... Ah, wow, that, uh, that, that, that's a really colorful background there, especially the fact that you got a chance to grow up in a home full of artists. Uh, so, so Tang, <laughs> were you also surrounded by artists? Is, is that also what influenced you to jump on into the craft? The opposite. I mean, uh, <laughs> my parents wanted me to become, you know, a doctor or something. But uh, growing up in the 80s, I was, you know, into comic books and video games. And, and I didn't even know you could do this as a, a job, really, until I saw this uh, behind the scenes movie making in the early 90s called Movie Magic. And it happened to show uh, the making of Empire Strikes Back. And it had models and artists drawing and whatnot. And I, at the time, there wasn't, internet wasn't readily available. So I didn't realize what you could do until maybe in college. And when mm. I found out about that, I, I, I found out about a guy named Sidney. And he went to this particular school called Art Center learning how to design cars. And I'm like, if I want to do that, I have to follow in his footsteps. So that's what I did. I applied to the school, I got in, and then luckily enough, years later, um, I got to work with the person in that movie magic uh, <laughs> video, and then it was amazing. So I, <laughs> it was, it was kind of like a full circle in a way. Yeah, uh, th th there's nothing like being inspired by someone and then you turn around and shoulder to shoulder, you're, <laughs> you're actually yeah. doing the thing <laughs> with that yeah. person. <laughs> So, so then, was that your big break then? Like, when you got a chance to work with uh, the person from the Movie Magic video, would you consider that to be your first big break? Um, you know, to be honest, um, when I went to car design school, you kind of get swept up with whatever everybody else is doing. Mm. And, um, I was intent on becoming a car designer, but I took uh, a production design class as an elective, and the, the instructor took us out to studios, and uh, I met a person that was happening to be working on a car design, <laughs> uh, or not car design, a car commercial. And he's all like, hey, if you want to, you come out and help us out. So I did that, and I enjoyed it so much that I, during my times off, the break time during school, I would go freelance for them. And then uh, when I graduated, luckily enough, Lucasfilm came down and offered me a job. So one of my first jobs coming out of school was working on a Skywalker Ranch. <laughs> wow. So it was pretty amazing, you know, like I was really fortunate, really fortunate. Oh, oh my goodness. Wow. Uh, talk about like starting in the big leagues <laughs> the first time at that. <laughs> oh gosh. And so, so Eric, then for you, what would you consider to be your first big break? When was that moment when it hit you that like, oh, hold on, I'm actually doing this, doing this. So yeah, I was, uh, so I graduated from our Institute of Chicago in 2006 and um, came out here and I was like a PA. I grew up in Los Angeles mm. and um, went to school in Chicago, came back to LA and um, I was a, a, a PA for the art department for like, uh, since like 2008, 2000, I wanted to do like set design because, you know, like you're just trying to, as a PA, you're trying to find what you're want to do sure um and uh, a production assistant is what a pa is and um i was in the art department got to learn about you know blueprints got to learn about scale got to learn about you know illustration got to learn about um all these different things and my goal was to get into the union wanted to get into the union because then you get benefits and you know i have add you know some people believe it some people don't you know mm -hmm but it costs a lot of money, pharmaceuticals, you know? Yeah. So I, that was my goal. I needed healthcare, you know? So uh, I was on this show and it was 2008. Uh, the, the show got canned because of the writers. Uh, there was a writer strike then. Uh -huh. And I was just like, I don't, this isn't for me. I don't want to do this anymore. And I tried to become a Buddhist priest. And, really? Uh, okay. Yeah. And, wow. um, 
and then, you know, study, try to learn Japanese, get back to my roots, all this kind of stuff. And then um, I needed money to go there and uh, I wanted the, the temple that I went to, uh, I wanted to try to uh, have them help fund me, but that didn't work. So I didn't become a Buddhist priest and I'm like, what the heck do I do? I'll go back to the movie industry. So then from there, I got picked up uh, uh, for Thor one, Thor number one. Yeah. And uh, it's just from all the other people's people that I PA'd for in the past. And um, her, uh, the art director, Maya Shimaguchi, she, uh, she hooked me up and, you know, she's like, you got to figure out what you want to do, Eric. You know, I'm like, I just, I don't know. I'm just going to float and see what happens. It's like, no, you got to make a decision. You know, you have to, you can't just float, you know? So look, here's what the illustrators do. Introduced me to a guy named Ryan Meyerding who's the head visual development at, at Marvel. And, you know, I'm like, God damn, I can't do that shit. I can't do that. I, it, his, his artwork's amazing. I'm sure, Tang, you've seen his stuff. Uh, yeah, I was a classmate of his. So I've seen yeah? Wow. Amazing. It's like, you can't get there. And then, but, but he, he would share tips, this and that. And then I go to try to do set designing. And I, you know, I met another, you know, Kazra Farahani. He's another guy that I worked with. And have you, do you know him, Tang? I'm not familiar. Okay, but he uh, he's a production designer now, and he um, uh, amazing illustrator. But I, I don't know, like sets and you know it I, it it wasn't I wasn't interested in that. I was interested in the figure, you know. Mm. And I'm like, well, geez, I can't do what Ryan does, and I can't really. I'm not really as interested in set design. So and so then I went to the storyboard office, which was in the production office. It was not even in the art department. Mm. You know, probably I, I probably had to like give time cards or something, and I um, I ran into Darren Denlinger, and he was doing tons of, of drawings and telling stories, and I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. Hmm. You know, that's what I want to do. I want to do quick sketches, fast gestural, and telling stories. And it's like, okay, boom, that's my aim. So then. Um, Next, the next week, I told Maya Shimaguchi, like, hey, I know what I want to do. I want to be a storyboard artist. And she's like, oh, very good. Can you work Christmas? I'm like, okay, yeah, for sure. Wow. <laughs> uh, um, but I'd say, for, but as a storyboard artist, my big break was Get Out. Mm. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, wow. how did what? I get it? Someone didn't want it. And... Uh, not that they didn't want it, they were busy. A, a friend of mine, um, Robbie Consing, he uh, he's a, another great storyboard artist. He, I'm sure he was on something. And I mean, what all of us storyboard artists do, I don't know if illustrators do it too, but we all kind of, all the storyboard artists kind of talk to each other. So, you know, you know where the next gig is going to come because we're freelance. I mean, mm. you have a job one day and then boom, you're, you have, you're, you're unemployed. You know, Man. so like this whole unemployment crisis now, it's kind of like, oh, my God, everyone knows what we're going through. Right. <laughs> Not having a job. That's what we go through all the time. Hmm. I mean, Tang, does that happen to you? I mean, well, luckily I was employed by a VFX company for 15. Oh, that's dope. Straight years. And then when I moved down to L.A. about three years ago, I went free freelance like you got into the union. and I've been doing what you've been doing ever since. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the union just kind of opens a door and lets you work on feature films and, and TV. Mm. So if you're not in the union, you kind of, you, you, you can't do stuff. You, you can't work on, on, on films and videos. I'll tell you about how I got in a little later, but it's not the most <laughs> kosher way of getting in. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, feel, I feel like there's a a, a vibrant story right there. <laughs> but, yeah. but now that it, you you both kind of alluded to something that we have to touch on because this is the reality that that we're living in right now, which is we're living in a time where the pandemic surrounds us. So and it's been impacting all of us in different ways. So for the two of you, I know Tang, you said that 
you, know, you, you spent quite a bit of time working uh, specifically for a company. So now in a time where a pandemic is surrounding us, how has COVID touched your work? Um, I've been working at home for almost a year now. Um, I, had, I recently, he's almost two now, but I had a child. And my intent was always to take a little bit of time. And, and the, the project I chose right after Westworld allowed me to work from home, not mm-hmm. knowing that this COVID shutdown would happen. And just to see him grow and watch <laughs> And then it prolonged into a full year. So um, a year into it, it, it's kind of almost like a blessing in disguise. We, mm. um, Eric can attest to this. We work a lot like a lot and and a lot of times we're working on on site and by the time i would go to work he'd still be asleep when i come home he'd still he gone to sleep so i'd miss a big chunk of his life but being here and working from home um it's not the most ideal situation but i've gotten to see my son grow and that that to me has has been um uh immeasurable i would say oh Wow, that, 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 that's a beautiful uh, lining for you. I'm, I'm glad that you've been able to experience that additional part of your personal life, right? So you, yeah. you, it's, it's in a way you've gotten your personal life back some. Yeah. Um, Eric, for you, I know that you've emphasized how important that the union has been for you. Um, during this COVID time, has the union kind of also been a comfort and a shelter? Or how, how's that worked out? Um, they don't find work for you. Mm. The union does not find work. For, I wish they did. But when I started storyboarding, I, well, I first got fired as a PA, you know, and I was, that was my opportunity to just be like, let me send my portfolio out. And um, I, I sent it out to an agency, Storyboard Zinc, and um, they liked my work. It was like looser and it was gestural and, and they brought me in. And that's kind of how I started. So. Um, did a lot of commercials and got to understand the film language and got to understand, you know, how fast you're supposed to go or, and, um, but uh, during this pandemic, uh, the Storyboards Inc. has helped me a lot, um, Mm. you know, with, with extra work for commercials, but also uh, like animation's pretty big right now. Oh, right. So um, that's been, that, that kept me afloat. Yeah, so so now I want to dig um, a little bit deeper into you know some of your HBO credits right now. So, Tang, Westworld, man, what what a show! I mean, uh, Jonathan Nolan and Lisa Joy, like they, th- their brains just take us on some wild spaces. So for you to plug into that zone and to be able to give the show what it needs, how did you get into that headspace? Uh, obviously, I watched. This, the two seasons prior over and over and over just to, to, to get to understand the look and feel. Yeah. And then um, when, we, when I started, my, my role was really small. I was hired to do a vehicle, the, the flying hovercraft. Oh. Um, so I spent oh. a few weeks to do, designing that. And then uh, fortunately, uh, John, uh, Jonah, Jonah Nolan, he liked what I did. And I got to do design the robots. And then I got to design the mech. And then I got to design some bigger environments and whatnot. So um, just being a, gaining their trust or, or gaining the, the production designer's trust, uh, Howard Cummings, which was great. Um, when you work on a film, sometimes uh, you don't really even get to interact with the director. Yeah. <laughs> mm. But uh, Howard was very uh, open and he brought me into the meeting so I can hear directly from, from Jonah himself and, and understand his thought process. And he's brilliant. He's just, he, he's just very smart and he knows what he wants um, and he can communicate the idea. Sometimes um, some directors, they, they know what they want, but they can't communicate it verbally. Mm. But him, he's very direct. He knows what he wants and it, it helps me, especially when you're on a, a time crunch, to deliver exactly what you want. <laughs> right, right. It, it seems like being able to effectively and efficiently communicate a vision is, is of tantamount importance. And then he's able to verbalize his thought process, which is very important because you'll pick mm-hmm. up little nuances here and there that uh, would trigger stuff that you wouldn't, wouldn't normally come up with yourself. So, so it always helps to be in the room when they're coming up with the ideas. Uh, can, can you think of one specific example, maybe, of, of, of one time where he said something and it just totally sparked the vision for you? 
Oh, it was um, the way the, the, the hovercraft or um, the vehicle ship would take off. Like uh, initially I designed a uh, different type of propellers and then he suggested something that would vector. And it kind of completely changed how the propellers would, instead of being outside of the, the, the fuselage, it'd be integrated into it. So stuff like that. He, he's, he's brilliant, like the way he thinks. It, it, it's almost like an engineer in a way. <laughs> Just way of problem solving. Man, uh, and and I know, Eric, that you also work with quite a visionary. Um, in fact, you've got quite now a track record of teaming up with Jordan Peele. You know, most recently, as we've been able to see so far on screen, most recently, Lovecraft Country. But you've got some other stuff in the works as well, too. But, but I want to hear from you with Lovecraft Country. Bro, like we just recently caught the finale, the season finale. That show is bananas. So what's <laughs> that relationship like between you and Jordan Peele? Did, as you were hearing Tang talk, does it sound like you both have had some similarities there within working with your directors? Well, um, what Tang was saying about trust, you know, is I, I think gives me confidence once the director trusts um, the artist. Mm -hmm. because then they feel like, okay, there's a baseline, uh -huh. you know, like, you know, sometimes you, uh, like, I have a solution for you, Tank, for the directors that don't know how to verbalize it, mm -hmm. you just draw something crappy, <laughs> so then they can, like, no, 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 it's like, or not crappy, just get your, get the first thing out, yeah. you know, because, and let them react to it, and let them tell you that it's wrong, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you know that that's not the direction. But what I've learned from, you know, Jordan Peele and just improvisation, yes and. Hmm. You know, yes and things. And then then you start, you could explore a little bit more, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, but when it, when it comes down to the, you know, when it's about to get shot, there's going to be a moment when you have to say no. Oh, you wow. know, or a director would probably say no or yes, that's a great idea that let's do it. You know, cause like saying no is so powerful because it, it, they, they, they know something different that you don't, I think. Mm. Um, again, like, I think there's, there, there's someone they say like, instead of saying just no and nothing after you say no, because or something, mm -hmm. but, um, I, giving reasons is, is, is very important. I think, you know, just mm. showing the logic, um, of why you chose something is very important. Mm. Um, I'm sure Tang, you, you may go through, like you're talking about the fuselage, you know, yeah. And, yeah. and how like there's logic behind that. Right. And, um, so you're using both left and right side of the brain. Yeah. Um, uh, but like Jordan Peele, he, he, like when I was on Get Out, I mean, he was just so receptive and, and on and Us, super receptive. And mm. I really recommend people watch Us again because yeah. there's a lot of commentary that's happening now that mm. that movie showed um, before mm. the pandemic, you know, before yeah. the racial, well, I mean, racial injustice was already there, but it, it really, um, uh, it, it, I, I would recommend people watch it again because there's a lot. I mean, that was a big movie for me, mm. spiritually and, uh, and and cinematically. Mm. Um, yeah. But um, my bad. No, 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 that, no, that, that was, that was amazing. I mean, cause, cause in fact, I actually just wanted to, um, to, to add to that question because I know that you get the chance to work with Jordan Peele as the EP on Lovecraft Country, but you really also get a chance to work with Misha Green as a yeah. director. Yeah. So like, yeah. What, what can you tell us about working with Misha? Dude, she's dope. Ah. She's, she's real smart and she knows what she wants, you know? And, um, and again, she's very receptive. Like, um, I'd say episode 108, which mm. was Jigabobo, oh. I think. Oh, 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 oh. Do you, have you seen that one? I, I haven't seen 108. Uh, I haven't come okay. on yet. Yeah, well, to be honest, I haven't, seen, I, I haven't seen it yet either, but 
of because I, I I don't like watching it quite yet because it's very personal for me. You know what I mean? It's it, it's there's points where I'm just like, it's a little embarrassing, you know? Because <laughs> I feel very I feel it's very personal. Uh-huh. I don't know if that happens with you, Tang, when you watch Westworld, but it's like it, it moments. It comes back to you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean. It, it, it was done so long ago. I was on the show a while ago, like over a year ago, that I have a little bit of distance from it, so I can mm. appreciate it as a fan. But I, mm. I know what you're talking about. <laughs> like, I just, it's it's a little self, uh, I feel self-conscious a little bit. So, like, I like to wait, and, and then, like, you know, actually people started, more, more people started following me after I did the first uh, what, behind the scenes thing. Mm. Oh, HBO. okay. And yeah. And it's like, oh, wow, people are liking what we did, you know? So I'm like, okay, I, I guess I can get a little more confidence now, you know? Because <laughs> I, I don't know, you're, you're right next to the director. So you kind of feel like you've added, you, you're, you're sitting in the co-pilot seat with them. It kind of feels as a storyboard artist because you're, you're, you're helping them invent visuals that aren't yet described in the script. You're trying to make it visually more... Um, compelling mm. um, and uh, but I mean again Misha Green she was so much fun to work with she's super smart and uh, one thing she told me I was like you know how, how do you how do you write this stuff this is so great she's just like it's just truth wow. that's, that's what you got to do you got to just um, it's just truth you know you, you, you can't fluff it or any of that stuff you know you just um, and, and I, I was like, that, that's great. I love, I love hearing that. Cause I mean, we all want the truth, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And if you're able to, um, if you're able to, uh, embody it, mm-hmm. then I think you'll, I think you'll, you'll produce much greater work. Yeah. I, um, what you said right there, I think resonates not only through the work that you've done, but also with Tang, I mean, in Westworld, we've seen so much truth, but we're kind of like Eric, when you were talking about watching us um, and even moments in, in Lovecraft Country, where it's like, okay, if you revisit this moment, you'll see that in a way, uh, this also semi predicted or kind of is speaking to the moment that we all are living in in real life. I feel very similarly, Tang, about Westworld, because even though we're looking at a future there, we're looking at these robots, we're looking at this kind of revolution. There are so many social issues that we are confronting head on. So both of you, since you both have experience working on shows that are very, like they're not hiding their social commentary. How does it feel? What are you seeing in your field now in terms of the social changes that we've been seeing in terms of uh, racial justice now being something that's really being put on Front Street? You, you can't ignore it. You, you know, it, it, it's right here. And so we're all moving and, and, and figuring this thing out together. How are you experiencing that feeling within your industry? Uh, Tang, I'm going to toss this one off to you first, please. Um. Yeah, I mean, if that wouldn't happen, if that is not moving, I wouldn't have a job, to be honest mm-hmm. with you. You know, like, say, 50 years ago, there was probably, I don't think there was any Asian wow. people working in Hollywood, in, our, in, our, in the art department. Maybe I could be wrong, but that's what I'm guessing. Mm-hmm. Um, nowadays, I see so many more women production designers, uh, uh, people of color, uh, at all different levels within the art department itself, you know, and, and it's great to see because you want to see, uh, like for me, the reason I be pursued art was there was a comic book artist. Uh, I'm not sure you, you know him too, uh, named Jim Lee. You oh, know, yeah. his, his last name is similar to, he's Korean. Yeah. And growing up, you know, I saw all these, you know, uh, English last names. And the mm-hmm. first time I saw Jim Lee, I thought he was a, a, a white guy until I went to the Comic Con and I saw him. He was a, <laughs> oh, he was an Asian guy like me. I'm like, and he's doing he's drawing X Men, and we're just like, if that's what I want to do, you know, I don't want to be a doctor, <laughs> not you know not because I can't. I'm scared of blood. Sorry. <laughs> but <laughs> he could draw and he could create worlds, and, and and it was just amazing to me. It was like magic, 
basically. So um, seeing that for me um, really changed my perspective on what I wanted to do in the future. And seeing, you know, um, you know, people of color, people of different ethnicities, religions doing these, and especially these interviews, and, and someone out there can see them, and in five, six years, they're like, I could do this too. And, and it's just, you know, steps to something yeah. bigger. Yes. Um, it's just funny when you mentioned uh, seeing these interviews can really inspire someone. Eric, that ties back to what you just said about people seeing you talk about the behind the scenes stuff within Lovecraft Country and actually reaching out to you. They see a face. They see a face and people may actually see themselves in you. So, you know, with, the, with communities with Black, Indigenous and people of color, are you seeing some movement in terms of the industry making way for more people and or are people just like creating their own way, creating programs? How are people getting in? Hmm. How are people getting in? Um, I do see, okay, here's, here's something interesting. After Get Out, mm -hmm. um, I started, when I, I, after Get Out, you know, I didn't go straight on to another feature. I still went back to commercials and it was pretty dope because now I was seeing, it wasn't just Caucasian people in the, in, in the, um, what do you call them? Treatments. Right. Oh, you know, yeah. like they do treatments. So then I started seeing like more, more black people in there. And, and then I started seeing people like taking screen grabs from get out and putting it inside of their, inside of their treatments. And I'm just like, okay, there's a change happening. Okay. This is great. You know, I'm so glad that this is like, um, it's making me feel comfortable, you know? Um, and, and that, that it's okay to be, um, to think differently, mm -hmm. you know, it's okay to, everyone has a story, mm -hmm. you know, and like growing up, you know, I, I, I never thought that I had a story or I never thought I had stuff to talk about, you know, mm -hmm. because I don't know, you, you see like, you just don't, I, I didn't feel comfortable where now I'm starting to feel comfortable mm. um, sharing my stories. Cause like, I mean, there was a time when I was in Chicago and I had a similar experience that Jordan Peele had. I, I was, I went into a bar with some friends and then I see this Asian guy across the way looking at me and just staring at me. And, and I'm just like, you know, I'm gonna hold my ground. I, fuck, get this guy, you know? And then I, I was like, you know, I'm just going to talk to him. I just, just tell him, stop staring at me. I went over and it was a mirror. It was a freaking mirror, you know? And it's like, I was not. Wow. You know, like, I, and then when I, when I heard Jordan had something similar happen to him, I was like, oh my God, this is, a, it's not just me. That's, that's nice. Dang. You know, it's wow. pretty nice to hear that, you know? Um, and that, we all have similar stories, but, um, but I do see the industry changing. Mm. Thank goodness, you know, mm. Mm -hmm. because there's talent everywhere and there's style, different style everywhere. And mm -hmm. it's like, you got to keep being curious, man. You can't just keep, um, doing the same thing, you know, like, to be honest, like, uh, no offense, Tang, <laughs> uh -oh. but, but I, I, I always see the same illustrations on the art department board. That's always blue. And like, uh, it's just the same colors, very saturated, you know, mm -hmm. but it sells, you know, but it's like, um, I, I like to see things. I like to be curious of different things, you know, like uh, I, there was a point when I was like, you know, I, I, I want to try to not be digital anymore. I want to just go back to traditional, you know, um, just pencil drawings, you know, mm. um, because there's something very authentic about it is very immediate and raw. And um, like, there was this whole thing was did this uh, just like how film, what happened with film, like people in um, digital took over and now no one does film. You know, my dad was an expert in film, 
expert. He knew everything about perforations, about aspect ratio, and about just how to cut, like literally cut the film mm. and, and, you know, and literally pasting it together. Wow. And it's like, it's lost, but they still use the terminology. And my dad still knows the process and the process is still the same, you know? And, um, but I do see, I mean, coming back to the question, I do see a change happening and it's, is making me feel really thankful and, and grateful, you know, for, for people to see the change. Cause um, there's a lot of talent out there and there's a lot of talent that untapped talent, you know, that um, that'll be freaking the future. I'm mm. sorry. I don't have the words. It's just, no, it, there's potential. Yeah, no, I, I think that this sentiment, I think that you're expressing it quite authentically. And uh, and for everyone who's watching this and who's watched this so far, by the way, thank you all so much for, for tuning on in and staying because Eric and Tang are dropping some real, some real truth gems right here. Um, but I, I'm guessing, and this is before, we're about to open it up for Q&A in just a couple moments. But before that, I know that one of the key questions that often pops up at Q&As are, you have a lot of people that are aspiring, that are watching this right now and, and trying to figure out, well, today in 2020, like I get it. I get when, when Eric came in the industry, it was a bit different. When Tang came in the industry, it was a bit different maybe. But how do I participate in the industry now? How, like where would you recommend that I even start? Um, Tang, I'll go to you uh, and then we'll go to Eric and then we're gonna bring in some of this audience Q&A. This this is just my opinion, but I feel that you can anyone can learn the software that mm -hmm. is required in the industry, but not everybody has the eye for it. Mm -hmm. So uh, you have to train your eye, and also to to to, to come about and and also to have a, a genuine perspective, because mm -hmm. uh, you don't want it to be a risk. I would say uh, just doing what other people want. You want to be able, also be able to have perspective and bring a little bit of what you're about into whatever you're, you're, you're working on. And that's most important because mm -hmm. if you just become a risk, you'll, it's not fulfilling at all. You'll be miserable. Right. And if you do something that you're truly into and excited about, you'll want to do it even more and give more than just 100% of yourself. You know, you'll devote hours or, or, or you'll think about it when you're off, off of work. So it will just make whatever you put out even more uh, honest and, and special, I would say. So, um, you know, going back to it, I, I would just say um, for younger people coming into the industry, I would just say uh, find your voice, you know, find mm -hmm. your perspective. Because all the technical skills you'll, you'll, you'll gain as you work. Mm -hmm. um, you'll, go, you'll learn it through school or um, you'll learn it on the job, to be honest. Mm -hmm. It, it's, it sounds like you're really placing a lot of importance on the idea of not just only studying your craft, but also kind of figure out what your identity is. And, and that's major. That, that, that's, exactly. that's a big exactly. thing. Yeah. You'll be hired for your skill set, but you'll also be hired for your uh, perspective. On, on mm. Mm. Oh, yeah. Eric, like, you echo that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm a fourth generation Japanese American. Mm hmm. My grandparents were in the internment camp. They said they loved it, you know, because they were 21. They didn't have to work. They were having fun. That's how they met, you know, mm. and that's the truth. But maybe I'm sure I know, like my, my grandfather's brother had whooping cough and he died in the internment camp. There was still misery. There's horrible stuff, but you got to look at the positives during hard times, mm. you know, and um, me becoming a Buddhist, like trying to become a Buddhist priest, learning more about my past, you know, is, is very important about my roots. When I was a kid, I thought, I was like, man, what would it be like in the Greek and Roman times, you know, they're wearing togas. I'm like, holy shit, I wouldn't be there. I'd be in Japan, feudal Japan. Like right. I'd be like either a farmer or a samurai, you know, I mean, or, 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 a, or a trades person, you know, probably, I, I don't know, but I'm so Americanized that you, I, 
I lost what I, or I never was understood what my background was. So, I mean, I'm thankful my, my parents took me to a Buddhist temple, mm. you know, I mean, got bullied there, you know, but I still, um, it, it resonated somehow because in 20, in 2008, I, you know, I wanted to become a Buddhist priest, you know? So it's like life, follow your, Follow what interests you, even though if like one day you think you're going to be a set designer and the next day you think you're going to be a priest and then the next day you think you're going to be an illustrator and the next day you're going to be, it's okay. Mm -hmm. You're just learning all these things. And then it, it starts to all come together, Mm. you know, and like, I'm still learning new things, you know, and, but go with what you think is interesting. Like there's one time my brother was like, man, I really want to get into animation, you know, but I, I love 2D animation. And I don't want to do 3D animation, you know, and everyone's saying that 2D animation is dying. Everyone's saying that, you know, 3D animation is the way to go. I'm like, dude, if you want to do 2D animation, do 2D animation because hmm. you're going to make it dope. You're going to make yeah. a change. Yeah. If you want to do stop motion animation, do it. Because if that's what sparks you, then you're going to learn a ton of stuff that's going to help whatever your path is going to be, but it'll Mm -hmm. all come together. And, um, I, I'm still, I, I'm playing around with ZBrush right now. I, Hmm. that's like a sculpting program, a a, a 3d sculpting program. You you probably heard of it, Tang. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of learning blender. I'm a, it's, my head's just kind of going all over the place. I'm like, you know, let me just get back to drawing, you know, (laughs) but, but for me, my base is drawing. Gotcha. My base. So like I can always go back there and be comfortable, you know? So like I learned ZBrush so I could learn anatomy, better understanding the forms of like, you know, the forearms and stuff. And, um, I, I, uh, I, 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 um, Ryan King's line is one of the uh, teachers tutorials. I don't know if you've heard of him, Tang, hmm. but he's he he's he's a great teacher and um, always being humble of learning new things. Not saying like, oh, I know everything about no, storyboarding, is no. <laughs> <Because> I don't. <laughs> but I learn something new each each time that I yeah. do it and able to. Um, bring yeah like tang was saying bring more than just being a wrist you know yeah because like one day your wrist is gonna break mm -hmm. and you know what if you have it here you can still use your other hand Mm. Mm. i suck with my left hand but i could probably still get the shot you know hey well it's it's quite wild just to hear the parallels between both of your paths even though you seem to have started off in quite different spaces because you know eric i'm thinking about the training that like everything that you studied in order to perhaps become a buddhist priest but that now you're able to tie on in and to bring into your work in a different way and tang the fact that like man you were gonna be a car dude like you were a car guy but now you just said that with westworld one of the first things you worked on there was a flying craft and so you still were like i'm sure that your background within cars helped to come in and help to make you the right guy for that job so um kudos thank you thank you for opening up and sharing so much so now i'm gonna open this up to our audience i'm gonna jump on in with our first audience question we've got june chung from brooklyn new york brooklyn stand up what's up june um june says uh let's see art activism and identity are so intricately tied but oftentimes people find different sources for their art but i feel like most of our childhood sources for art were from joy How do you preserve joy in your practice and how have you sustained your practice to be joyful and easeful? Hmm. So joy, where do you find it? How do you keep it? Tang, that's a big one. Take it away. I know. (laughs) Go for it, man. You get paid to draw stuff. I mean, who who does that? You know, I mean, 
there's a story. Long t- when I was, well, one of my first jobs out of, out of school was working at Skywalker Ranch. Mm-hmm. And during lunch, we would, they had community bikes. You'd ride the bikes around, and they would take breaks and throw the Frisbee around. So we were just like, we were, per- we were paid eight-year-olds, essentially. <laughs> wow. We draw spaceships and color spaceships, eat hamburgers, and throw the Frisbee around. <laughs> <laughs> so, was, um, you know, we were just extremely fortunate. I mean, there's really tough days as well, too. But when you when you have perspective on things, it's just I wouldn't trade it for anything else. Oh, that's fantastic! So you, you just always go back to the Skywalker Ranch joy. <laughs> it's good. There's moment. Every show has its moments. Yeah. But it's it's just something you can always pull from. Oh, I love that. And uh, Eric, what about for you? Where, where's your joyful space? Um, my joyful space is people, mm. you know, like the people I work for and the people that, uh, I show my work to, mm. because again, it comes back to like, you know, if they like it, then you feel confident and you can feel like you can explore and you can be yourself, you know, um, mm. because sometimes like there are directors, been directors where they don't say much. And you don't know where you stand. Oh. And that's so insecure. Right. I feel insecure because there's no grounding. And then until they see it, and then they rip it apart, and they tell you what you did wrong, and then and then they, they finally give you the direction, and it's kind of like, okay, and now I know where he wants me to go, or she <laughs> wants me to go. Yeah. Uh, we'll just go, yeah, I'll just do it. That's why like, I feel like relationships are very important and that's what brings me joy. And that's why I love working with the people that I work with. Hmm. Yeah. Man, uh, you know, yeah, like it's, it's, it's nice to have your path illuminated by, by the vision. So you're not stumbling around in the dark there for sure. So uh, someone who wants some additional illumination here, um, Erica Benfield from Northridge, California. Oh, that's kind of near where I'm at. Uh, how do you get in the mindset of the subject or category that you're trying to execute? So do you read the script? And what questions do you ask to better prepare for a project that you're hired to work on? It's funny, this actually, you, you started kind of to answer some of this already, Eric, in terms of um, trying to get the, the true vision from the director in order to help you out there. Um, so Tang, I want to, I want to uh, direct this one kind of to you um, to figure out how do you get in the mindset or, or the subject? It, it depends on the project you work on as well. If it's a, a established universe or if it's something brand new um, mm. or Westworld example, um, the production designer had pulled a ton of reference before I got on the show. So I'd okay. spend time just, you know, delving into it, looking at it, looking at it, letting it soak into my mind. And then I would do my own research. Mm. Uh, a lot of it has to do with like how things are made, things are, how things are manufactured, um, stuff like that. And then you just go at it. I guess I've been going, doing it for so long that it, it's almost, it is second nature, mm. in the design process. So what I would do is, you know, listen to what they would want, create a design for what they want, what I envision it, and then something radically off the wall and mm. uh, most of the time it lands somewhere in between <laughs> <laughs> okay. so they'll take pieces of everything and then you'll come up with a, a better solution i should say well when when you talk about research since you've been in the game for quite a while yeah. i have to imagine that when you first started the internet wasn't what the internet is now. No. So, 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 so what did you used to do in order to research versus like how you're able to research now? So as you can see, the bookshelves behind me, they're empty, <laughs> but normally they're filled. I have thousands of books and, and I, I read a lot. And, uh, you know, I, I research on the internet. Uh, I use Pinterest, the pin stuff that I like. Mm. Um, I'm always going back to uh, what I like and what's new. I, I read a lot of uh, science journals, uh, mm-hmm. technology stuff. Um, just kind of, luckily I do what I like. And it's all like that kind of science, science fiction, science fantasy type stuff. So, so that, that I'm always constantly bombarded with that information. 
Oh, gorgeous. Cool. I mean, it, it's apparent in, in your work. So we thank you for that. And let's see, we actually, we have a question um, that's directed specifically to Eric now. Uh, Melissa Isidore from Boston. I, I, I just love that these questions are coming in from all over the place. This is, this is fantastic. Uh, so Melissa wants to know, Eric, how do you choose what scenes to capture? And how does scene selection better illustrate the whole story? I feel like we're about to kind of understand even a little bit more about just like your whole thesis as an artist within this question. So go for it. Um, usually the director chooses. Oh, okay. Which, uh, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, um, yeah, the director usually chooses, but I infer that the reason why they do it is because usually you put on to the third act or the first act in the beginning because those are the most complicated and storyboarding again it's to show or it's you're, you're, you're kind of you're drawing the movie mm -hmm. so producers want to know okay what's visual effects what's special effects can we how can we minimize the, uh, how much things are going to cost so like uh, if you start drawing the movie you can see like oh look there's an explosion there well is that going to be practical or is that going to be VFX you get a price comparison, you know, so it usually uh, comes down to price, yeah. you know, uh, I mean, it still is a business, you know, and you still got to know what you're paying for. And like, is that explosion going to be worth it? Or should we spend the money on the hovercraft? Huh. You know? Um, and again, how much is that's going to be practical? How much? Is, so there's a lot of um, thinking behind it. And like, especially like coming from, uh, like me starting out in lower budget films, you know, you really have to think what's the most effective way that you could tell this story with this limited amount of budget, hmm. you know, do, it's better to, is it better to show or is it better to not show, hmm. you know, hmm. um, and, or is it, you know, you got to think in those terms. And now I'm kind of jumping into um, like Marvel and it's, it's better to show it. And it's, I'm going into another um, another style of storytelling, mm. you know, that I'm, I'm learning a lot, you know, as I'm working on Marvel stuff, because uh, it, it's like, it's like um, you could do, uh, I don't want to say you could do whatever you want, but it's like you could do, um, you could show more. So it's kind of like, I mean, it, it almost sometimes felt feels a little bit more liberating when you have some mm. constraints or some, mm. some limits, mm. you know, like, I mean, with painting, if you're painting, you're constrained to just the colors and your canvas, you know, and, and your paintbrush, you're limited. And mm. what can you create from that? But when you have, when you can do anything, it's like, Okay, let's just, I mean, I think that's that, I think Tang likes doing anything. <laughs> is, is that true, Tang? Do, do you? Uh, as when I work on, I, basically when I work on my own projects, they never finish because I can do anything. And <laughs> I'm like the hardest critic on myself. But like what uh, Eric says, is if you're doing a limit, limited color palette painting where you have three colors, it's a lot easier to get something done because you have three colors. But if you say you have the whole palette available to you, you know, it, it can become a mess really quickly. You don't know where it should go. So, mm. um, too many choices. Marvel, yeah, Marvel films tend to be, uh, you know, you go there to see the film, but also to see a visual spectacle. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an event. So that's why it, I think you can show a lot more than you used to. Yeah, but it's it's a great um, experience. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. it's uh, it's a different way of thinking, you know, mm -hmm. thinking in terms of of the yeah, spectacle, mm -hmm. you know, and that's also art, you know, and that's mm -hmm. also like uh, there is this old video I saw. It's called the Craymaster Cycle. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's a uh, old performance art video, but it was they spent like millions of dollars on it, and it's uh, it's just bizarre. And they spent so much money on it, but it's like, uh, it's, it's beautiful at the same time, you know? Uh -huh. And it's like, I think that there is an art to extravagance. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and there's an art to decadence, you know, and they show that in like Rococo art, you know, and they show that in um, um, like Renaissance art. And mm -hmm. I'm just, uh, but you know, it's, it's all, I mean, like, some of my favorite art, I, I love Basquiat, you know, mm, he's one of my favorite mm. artists, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, you would think it's like, like Michelangelo, I love Michelangelo, I love Leonardo da Vinci, you know, and, but um, there's just something expressive about, like, Picasso, there's something expressive about, like, Jackson Pollock, you know, mm -hmm. and it's like, it, it challenges what you know, hmm. you know, it challenges, like, it's not just all a photograph, you know? Yeah. And, I mean, hey, photographs are great. I love it, you mm -hmm. know? But um, just challenging the way that you think, you know? Yeah. It, it seems like for visual storytellers, but even just for people who consume visual, visual media, it is super beneficial to explore myriad options, to watch different styles, to just absorb and to take in, like you said, the extravagance, but also explore the minimalism, see what speaks to you. And, and even when you find your lane, you don't have to just stay in that lane, right? You continue to expand, you continue to, to look for other things that can only enhance and then strengthen your gifts. So Eric, Tang, thank you for sharing your gifts with us today. Um, right before we bring Taylor back on in for our closing, um, I want to give each of you a brief moment to let all of us know what's the next project that you're working on and or where should we be following you in order to keep track of just the mayhem that you are making. Uh, Tang, go for it. Take us first, please. Unfortunately, the projects I'm working on now are uh, all NDA, so I can't really talk about it. But uh, you can follow me and my work. Uh, you can go onto my website, www.tanglay.com. Uh, it has also links to my social media sites as well. So um, hopefully you guys can follow me there. Excellent. Well, well, we'll keep an eye out. So as soon as you're allowed to start sharing some stuff, we'll be on top of that. Um, so Eric, what about you? We, we know that Candyman, you and Jordan Peele have been working on that. But, but anything else you can tell us about? Um... No, okay. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and where, where can we follow you? Where can we keep track on, of everything? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm on Instagram for sure. Cool. Um, uh, I am not the best at posting, but feel free to, you know, um, ask me questions. And I'm, I'm always down to, to share um, because, I mean, everyone out there is the next big thing for everyone out there and you got to believe in yourself mm. you know because mm. no one else is gonna you know and when you do find people that are gonna then you go and marry them you know <laughs> <laughs> and then get the ring out yeah <laughs> yeah yeah and then and then but once you get married then you can't talk about that stuff at the dinner table <laughs> because then, then your, your passion gets transfer it over to your love, <laughs> your, 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 your significant other. And, and, and I miss it. What, what is that handle? What's your Instagram handle? I, uh, I don't know. Eric Yamamoto, I think, or Yamamoto Eric, I think, at Yamamoto Eric, I think. Sorry. We'll, I'm, I'm, we'll look it up. Everybody Google it. We'll, 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 figure, yeah. we'll figure it out. <laughs> Sorry. But yeah, no, I'm, I'm always free. I, I, I like to share experience because experience has been shared with me mm -hmm. yeah you know? and it's it's a lot of fun getting different perspectives and it's um you are the future Word. as i was the past you know and now now we're here yeah yeah i mean i, I think y'all are y'all are the present right now as well too so thank you thank you for giving us the gift of the present all right <laughs> taylor i want to welcome you back on in on that note appreciate you all <laughs> Your handle is Yamamoto Eric, by the way, Eric. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I got you. Um, Thank you. 
<laughs> that was really powerful. And there were so many moments where I just had chills. And I know a lot of other people are feeling the same way. And I can't wait to see what you are all up to next. I really just felt that. Um, so on behalf of all of the Tide Film Festival team, I want to thank Eric, Tang, and Albert for not only sharing your time, but your stories and journey to where you are now. And a huge thank you to HBO. Thank you to everyone for watching this panel. And as a reminder, we have several other free panels available to stream this weekend. We also have a dynamic slate of feature films and short screenings, which you can purchase tickets for on Tide's website at tidefilmfestival.org. Happy watching.